Michael's based in Lewis, um, and he's been doing amazing work around that area. Um, and you're massively into living compost and living soils. Um, just tell us a little bit about how you started and uh, what you do in, in a bit more detail. Yeah, well, I mean, my background, I, I was an electrician and I was doing like property renovations, developments, and my accountant was buying old banks and old pubs, things like that, and I was going in and converting them. But I've kind of always been quite kind of connected to like the natural environment. Uh, like formative memories are in the garden of my granddad and things like that, growing sunflowers. And so it was always something that was there. But I guess as I was sort of growing up, it sort of went a bit dormant. And it was like, my dad was an electrician. I was his apprentice. So I went into that. Um, and then, but I, everywhere I lived, I made sure I had a garden and I was out there growing and I got an allotment um, and that kind of really reignited it. Um, I've also been really kind of sensitive to kind of climate issues, just... I don't know where it comes from. I'm quite an anomaly in my family. So my mum has always called me her little eco warrior. Like from from as long as I can remember. I don't know. I don't know where it comes from. Um, so those things kind of they obviously kind of match up quite nicely. Um, and I I sort of I had this sort of I guess it was like this sort of paradigm shift where I I thought like the best we could do as like a human on the planet was like the least bad. Um, and so like I went to the extreme as I tend to do with things. I bought a Luton truck um, and I converted it and I lived in it for like nearly three years. Wow. Um, right up until my my wife was about to have our first son together. Um, and she was like, I want a home birth and I don't want to do it in a van. Um, <laughs> so we actually moved into a house. We've been in a house since. Um, <laughs> but um, yes, I had basically had this sort of shift where that was how I thought. And then I kind of discovered like permaculture, regenerative agriculture, and just just the, the possibility for regeneration. And it was just like, it felt like I was kind of living under this, like, like as it is today, this like cloud of like climate anxiety. Like, I don't think I was conscious that I had it, um, but I became aware of it suddenly when it sort of disappeared. And I was like, oh, okay, how can I, how can I do something that is regenerative? Um, like beyond sustainable, but actually making this place better. So the fact that that was a possibility just kind of was this sort of, whoa, okay, I'll find something to do. Um, and I, so I got this like bit of land that was really like degraded, compacted clay, cracked, like bare earth. It was like old horse pasture. And I thought, I know what I'll do. I'll, um, I'll demonstrate abundance and regenerate this soil and so, yeah, de demonstrate abundance, but actually building soil rather than it being like an extractive thing. That will be what I'll do. So I was doing that for a while and uh, I started asking around different mates, different growers, like, what's the best compost? I'm, I'm, I need help with this soil. Uh, I tried like a mushroom, spent mushroom based composted and manure based, a green waste stuff. And at the time, I, I hadn't studied like soil in the way that I have now. And, but even at the time, it kind of arrived and it was just felt like kind of inert, like... Mm dead Nothing to it. yeah some of them were black smelt like oil like one of them smelt like oil it was really grim um and i just thought this and there's nothing in it that i could see that was alive and that was kind of alarming to me um obviously i used what i got I that's why i tried a few and then i thought i'm gonna have to just make the compost because i'd always kind of being the eco war i'd always made compost and i guess that's where it came from the the parallel of like well there's normally my compost's normally like alive. Like, where where are the where are the bugs? Um, so I, yeah, started asking people for inputs. And the obvious thing, like I was sort of in Brighton. I'm from Brighton originally. Was like, I'll take your food waste. It was a big issue there. Like people are quite kind of green and eco there, and um, they don't do anything for food waste. Recycling's not even very good. Um, so I thought, oh well, there's I could like fix two issues. I could I could regenerate my soil and reduce people's waste um and so the idea for like compost club was sort of there i guess but then the first lockdown hit and uh i was doing the garden alongside my trade work and so i had this like window of of like Unity. yeah it just felt like everything was in flux suddenly and i thought what could i could i do something fully commit to something regenerative and maybe Essentially, what, what the thought process was, could I make, like, facilitate my activism as a job and do it all the time um, and just, like, basically, like, live regener regeneration rather than just, like, talking about it and saying, isn't it, isn't it wonderful? This is possible. Just do it. 
Um, so that was what I did. Just started started doing it, sort of scaling up. I didn't need to like see anybody directly. People would like, essentially the way what I do works is I reclaim these big like 30 litre buckets uh, from like construction trade. So they've, they've been used um, and sort of repurpose them, collect people's food waste, um, leave them a clean bucket. So the idea was like make the make a good choice a convenient one so people will actually do it there's no mess for them they just put their food waste in there um we use bakashi so it like ferments food waste so that's in the bucket and they get a little pot to add as they're filling it so um they can put cooked food meat dairy it's all food waste um and then i just come out in a little electric van and swap it over um for them and then i take it back to site and compost it and i've kind of i studied the soil food web so there's a lady called dr laningham who's like a soil microbiologist so i really like kind of just mind blown like constantly on this thing that I was Down learning rabbit holes as you do absolutely yeah and just learning about I, I thought like soil I mean I'd been growing for years on allotments and things and I thought like soil is like sand silt and clay right that's what soil is and it's I mean it's the most kind of diverse uh, ecosystem on the planet is soil like over half of the planet's life the species live within the soil and just like oh wow like and so it, I, I knew about like no dig, but I didn't really know why is that good. So I kind of learned about all that stuff and I thought, okay, well, I can, I can make compost that basically naturally harnesses these beneficial microbes. So I don't use any fossil fuels. I just, it's just cleverly designed kind mm. of infrastructure. It's essentially, it's kind of human powered, but it's more microorganism powered. They, I just sort of facilitate the conditions and then they do the composting. But I kind of say to people like I do sell compost, but actually what I'm selling isn't, just organic matter it's kind of the the microbes for the soil um compost is just how i how i kind of get them to 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 stay in one place contain them and how i deliver them um and then you can there's different ways of applying them um so yeah essentially i kind of it's a weird one i don't really know when people ask what my job is i kind of say like I'm just a soil nerd i don't know what the term is some one person said to me you're the most glamorous bin man that i know <laughs> um so yeah my 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 sole focus was in soil regeneration and how I could do that beyond just my own garden, but get it out to other people um, and and sort of as well share the message of that. Mm. So I was sort of running both the compost club and the garden together. And the impact that I was seeing, like just through social media and people like at the time, it was only social media. I couldn't like see many people in person. Um, the impact of it was far outweighing like making nice organic veg boxes for like the people that live near me. So I just let the garden go to somebody else and just thought I've got to dedicate to this thing. It's just basically become like my life is just like mm. saving, I mean, it's it, like saving emissions from food waste if it went to landfill is like a kind of happy byproduct. Cause it's just, for me, it's like, um, this might be getting a bit kind of like philosophical, but like when I think about like observable reality there is no waste. There's just like the movement of energy from a thing to another thing. There's just these natural nutrient cycling, like soil cycles nutrients with microbes. There's a water cycle, a carbon cycle. There is no waste anywhere. But as humans, we've developed this idea of waste and it's a really bad idea. And it's like leading to, potentially gonna lead to our demise on, on this planet. Um, but there's time to fix it and soil can sequester the carbon and we can build it rather than, we're losing like, ridiculous amounts of topsoil every year um, and we don't we could reverse that we can essentially turn sand into soil by applying organic matter and microorganisms uh, rather than the way that we're sort of farming essentially we're doing the opposite we're turning soil into sand mm. so what so is it a hundred percent sort of food waste that goes into the compost is it what else what is the process from sort of getting it and adding certain ingredients that you yeah. need to get it to basically how you have it in the bag? Should, yeah. we, have, should we pass that? I've got around? a little bag, yeah. If anyone wants to have a look at it, um, so it's it's uh, food waste is like my kind of nitrogen input, um, and like with everything, the more diverse sort of anything is, the more kind of resilient it's going to be, um, and so it's kind of introducing different microbes and stuff. So yeah, it's just food waste. Um, it gets bakashied at the beginning, so that's a fermentation. So you're adding EM, these effective microbes, the specific ones that will do that. Um, then it goes into um, different infrastructure and at that point I add in um, wood chips. So I actually take uh, tree surgeons waste wood chips, they come and bring that. Again, that's just a mixture, it's diversity again. Um, some people use different carbon inputs, but often it's kind of, they'll be using like shredded card and things like that, which is kind of sterile, whereas with the, with the wood chips, 
coming from wherever they've come from. They're bringing in mm. um, microbes, but specifically indigenous microorganisms as well, um, which is what you kind of want. You want your soil wants to be reflective of, of where it is. It, it kind of needs to. Um, and then I use biochar as well. Um, so the, the wood chips and the food waste and add biochar at the beginning. Um, I don't know if anyone knows about biochar, but it's... I've seen it on your, on your Instagram. Yeah. yeah what, what is that? It's like um, a stable carbon, essentially. So you can take waste wood and you do, it's called pyrolysis. So you basically do a burn with little to no oxygen. Um, so it, the emissions are, are really reduced versus if you just burnt it or if you just left it to sort of oxidize. Um, and then you, you end up with like, um, I think it's over 90% sort of stable carbon. There's like nothing else in it. Super light, super, super porous. Um, so it's really good for moisture retention and it's really good for sort of housing microbes. Um, and they've, they've looked at different ways of using it and applying it. It's particularly good in sort of um, like Mediterranean hot climates because of that moisture retentiveness. Um, and there's different ways of like inoculating it. And some people just buy it you know, as a product on its own and they'll inoculate it with different things and add it. Um, but there was a really cool bit of research, which was, they call it co-composting. So they, they add it at the beginning of the decomposition process so that it gets populated with all the microbes that are doing all of that work throughout the process. So you haven't got to inoculate it, it's sort of happened in that process. So that's how I use it. Um, it's amazing stuff. Like a, I think it was a, a centimeter cube. So like smaller than a sugar cube. Um, I don't know if anyone uses sugar cubes anymore. That might be a bit outdated, but I remember them. Um, smaller than that. Uh, if you were able to like make it flat by like slicing it, you, it's kind of impossible because it's tiny, but um, it would be like the size of a tennis court is how, how much structure is within that little, that little thing. So it's really cool, really cool stuff. And obviously if you're using it to, to put in the ground and you're doing these types of burns, it's essentially a carbon negative, it's like a carbon capture as well. Um, and obviously increasing ca carbon in the soil and it's mm. going to be in there, you know, for a long time. Amazing. So once the, com once you once the compost is matured enough and decomposed enough, where does, what, what do you do with the soil? Do you sell it on or you, yeah. you bag it? Yeah, I mean, the way it works for members, obviously they're, they're, they pay like a sort of so monthly fee. it's a subscription fee. It's a subscription model. thing, yeah. Um, I collect their food waste, take it away, compost it for them. Um, every spring they get some back. There's like two tiers of membership, so there's different amounts. Um, probably over half the people now, uh, one of the options is just you can donate it to a community garden. Um, got a really cool project or like on the side at Lewis Football Club um, where we've got a community garden we've built inside the stadium, like in the corner. Uh, we've got some composting going on there. So some people donate it, so some goes there, different other community gardens as well. And then the surplus that I make is actually what I sell. to, to basically, I mean, it's sort of been, essentially it's been like a passion project turned my actual job. Um, and so it, it just kind of funnels back into to growing it. So I've kind of, I've got one site that's basically at, almost at sort of max capacity. I mean, it is at max capacity, but I'm using sort of makeshift infrastructure and majority of it is there now. Um, I've got one more like of these big units that I use to get and then it's fully optimized. Um, and then I've got a couple of people that want to essentially invest and help me open up a couple more sites. Um, so it was kind of, I guess the beginning, the goal was, could I have something that's sort of economically viable and ecologically, not just sustainable, but regenerative, create that model. So I've sort of done that. So now the sort of, as happens with people, like the goalposts change, they've gone down the road. Now it's like, the vision is what I call like nutrient cycling towns and cities. So we're, it's not waste, it's, it's, wa it's wasted nutrients and we could cycle them and essentially reintegrate us as humans into a natural nutrient cycling system where we're, we're not releasing these emissions from our waste um, and we're creating something that's gonna build soil as well. And so the, within a city, like the, the sort of the visual that I use to sort of contextualize it, if you've got like surrounding agriculture, creating food, sending that into the city where it's like densely populated. We capture that in compost clubs, create green jobs for people. We cycle that using no fossil fuels. We green all the inner city landscapes because there'll be loads of the compost, export that back out to the surrounding ag. They can start to grow. They can wean off like biocide chemicals and, and inorganic fertilizers um, because the microbes basically mine nutrients from sand, silt and clay. It's, it's there, they just plants can't get it microbes make it accessible um and then they start to like they've looked at like there's this horrendous 
kind of correlation between like the application of like fertilizers and biocides and and like nutrient density going down in our food since that became like the green revolution um at the same time like almost at the same rate like chronic disease in humans and they sort of meet in the middle um so we can just fix a lot of problems by just changing our approach and just kind of like a little chiropractic tweak just getting back to, I mean, like, I guess the definition of nature is kind of everything outside of humans. And that's for me, like a big mistake. Like we are nature. There's this like philosopher, I think it's Alan Watts said like the, the earth peoples in the same way that an apple tree apples, like we are nature, we are it. Um, so it's just about reconnecting people. Sometimes essentially I sort of say with my members consciously or unconsciously, that's what's happening to them. I don't, I don't go up to people and go, hey, I'm reconnecting you, um, but um, <laughs> it just happens. <laughs> um, and it's quite nice when I speak to them as time goes on, they become a lot more kind of conscious as a consumer, generally, just from like the messaging that they're getting from and like being sort of connected to what I'm doing. I just sort of subtly, um, you know. Plug it. Yeah, <laughs> basically, yeah. Um, and obviously like the waste is an input, but I also try and share, like you don't have to waste that there are things you could do with this stuff um so yeah it's an interesting interesting little thing that i've got myself into what do you do because i know you obviously have the membership for domestic waste but then you also have the one for commercial yeah. waste as well so you collect the commercial waste so this from like restaurants supermarkets presumably not supermarkets, not supermarkets. Okay. no i mean supermarkets have kind of got pretty good now at working with like local food partnerships so they'll they'll redistribute that and it'll go to like food banks and things um but I, I basically work with like sort of independent local. So there's a juice bar and I get like, um, I've got like 30 litre buckets. I'm going to get 14 a week from them of like juice pulp. So it's all sort of pulverized up all the juice or a lot of the juice as much as they can extract from it. Um, but there's obviously still a lot of, a lot of nutrients in yeah. that, in that pulp that H I can how use. How do you go about sort of persuading these businesses to use your service? Because obviously, mm. you know, the cost of living crisis, people with small businesses, you know, mm. money's tight, whatever. And you're offering this, obviously this brilliant environmental service, but people are thinking, oh, hang on a minute. That's another cost that I've got to factor in. Yeah. How do you go about sort of finding those businesses in, yeah, yeah. Hel helping them? I mean, it's not an active thing anymore because I'm sort of at capacity. I've been for a while. So I just have like a waiting list, which is quite, it's like a problem because I want to get emails and calls all the time. Like, oh, can we join your thing? And I have to say, oh, I'm sorry. I can put you on a list. No. Um, um, and so businesses was actually what I targeted first um, because I obviously started from scratch. Nobody knew what I was doing. So I sort of targeted um, like the juice bar was one of the first because it's like a health thing. Um, and they're pretty good in terms of their sort of eco credentials generally. So it's an easy sell. I just said, this is what I'm going to start doing. Uh, what do you do with your waste at the moment? And they had someone who came and took it, but they actually didn't even know where it went. So I said, OK, we'll ask the question. And then they called me back and they said, can you deal with our waste? I, I didn't have to do any more. Um, and, uh, and obviously when, once there was a few other businesses, um, a couple of little cafes and things. And um, essentially I just messaged ones that I thought would have the right kind of clientele who would want to engage in it as domestic people as well. Um, and it sort of worked too well because the businesses obviously then doing that wanted to share that they're doing that. That's good for them to say, oh, we're doing this much more, you know, sustainable, actually regenerative thing with our waste now. Um, and then, um, I made a point of saying, let people know that I can do it for households as well. And I just became like overwhelmed with people at the beginning. Um, obviously started on quite a small scale. So I was just doing as much as I could to generate enough money to then buy like the next bit of infrastructure. And then another little wave of people could then join. So I've kind of built it. Essentially, I'm including the businesses. I do the equivalent of, I think, 150 to 180 households, um, all their food waste every three weeks. Um, that's just me. Um, I'm actually interviewing Monday finally for somebody to to come and like oh, wow. start doing the collections because there's so many opportunities like to come speak at things like this and um, and actually sort of uh, I was just saying to to uh, Ollie before we started something that um, was said earlier about working on the business rather than in it um, so this yeah there's a lot of opportunities that I essentially can't I don't have time for um, that are sort of a shame that I can't do them so I want to facilitate essentially more and just do much more kind of, I'm ju I've just launched like a course where I'm actually teaching people some of the methods that I use as well. Um, because the real thing, I think the real impact, obviously what I do is good, but the real impact I think will be like empowering and enabling individuals, groups um, to, to do it themselves. 
um, and just sort of sharing that. So I'm sort of getting into that side of things as well. Mm. So on, on a business uh, side of things, what, what is the biggest barrier for you to sort of take it to that next level and start to scale? Is it capital? Is it obviously the infrastructure, uh, staff? Yeah. Or, or all of the above. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's been slow. It's been slower than I'd like because I basically just, the savings that I had, I bought the initial infrastructure. Um, I didn't have enough savings, sadly, to just, I mean, if, essentially, if I had more money, I would just pop up sites. I've, I've people like all over the place saying, hey, we need what you're doing here. And um, not even just in the UK. Um, so there's like a massive, it's sort of people want it and it, ecologically we need it as well um so if if i could afford it i would pop them up all over the place so if anyone's got a load of money and they want to fund something good like um send me an email or like, uh, there's a couple of people that, that have basically said they'd help me or they'd basically like to invest in setting up a site and and then um yeah that, i mean finding people doesn't seem to be a problem i put a little call out just through social media kind of intentionally because i thought i didn't want to I, I want to bring in somebody who's interested in what I do rather than just advertising broadly. Yeah. Uh, and I got loads of people. I wasn't expecting it, which was really nice and quite a diverse mix of people. Um, it's about 50, 50 split men and women that wanted to be involved in it. Um, which is really cool that just through like an Instagram post or whatever, I got all this response of like, Hey, I want to work for you. Like I get people want to come and do like volunteering. Yes. Yes. A very purpose driven sort of yeah. project and job to be involved with, isn't it? That's like, it. And I want to maintain that. So anyone I employ, I kind of need them to have that. I think, um, well, I want them to mm. not necessarily need them to, but well, and anyone that, you know, if you did raise capital, you don't want someone that's going to sort of like just see the opportunity, commercialize it and just wipe out all that hard work and passion that you've put into it so far. Yeah. Yeah. And someone that's, very aligned in with what you're doing and where you want to go with it really yeah well the, the two people i mean i haven't been looking for people actively they're people that have approached me and said why aren't you doing this everywhere i mm. said oh, i can't afford it and they said oh I, I can help you with that um and then we've had like interesting every time there's one lady every time i go and speak to her like i'm it's just a bit like jaw drop hitting the floor thing it's like some other thing that she says oh, i could just do this for you and i'm just like okay <laughs> yes let's make it happen so just in the process of finding the right place, which I think we found now. Um, and yeah, I want to kind of just start, as I say, like cycling Working towns and cities, put it more. everywhere mm, is, the, is the plan. And that could be either, I'm sort of trying to work on a model where I don't necessarily have to be the person setting it up, almost like a franchise kind of thing, whereas where I'll just sort of teach my model, uh, all of it, like the financing, the insurances, the regulations, uh, just open source, what I do, how I do it, obviously teach them about the kind of the soil food web, um, why I compost the way I do, how they do all of that. And then they can set up their own one, essentially, mm. if they can finance, finance their own site. I can just say, I've had to figure out the this infrastructure that's it. required. I can just say, this has taken me three years. Here you go. You can just do it tomorrow. Um, mm. yeah. well, I don't know if you've seen it. There's a con I mean, I love the concept and I think it's a very scalable concept. Have you seen the company called Patch, which they basically go out and find like agricultural land that you know is not being used, mm. and then they will basically rent out the space on a subscription model for a little allotments, and you can choose your size. Yeah, I've seen those guys, um, and there's another one as well. Um, forget what they're called, where they're like specifically no dig. These guys, this yeah. one that I've seen, um, which is pretty cool. I was just going to ask on a more sort of personal domestic level. Mm -hmm. As a gardener, I'm only like now sort of discovering how vital, you know, soil health is, how important it is. Mm -hmm. What would you say are the best and worst things as a domestic personal amateur gardener you can do to your soil? Essentially, like with soil, it's kind of, uh, I don't want to go like soil nerd, but uh, I'll try and <laughs> no, do this like really, it. really. Go, go as soil nerd as you want. <laughs> so, okay, so uh, well, it's more a time thing, but like um, <laughs> essentially, like I say, in, in the sand, silt, and clay is all essentially like almost all the essential nutrients and minerals that plants need. They just can't access it. It's locked up in these little crystalline structures. Um, bacteria are small enough to mine it, and they start they they attach with this like carbon based alkaline glue, so they stay and they start mining it. And then fungi come along, they grab hold of those and they pull those in and stick those together and they create like a little macro aggregate which is kind of when you've got the nice crumbly texture in the soil that's what has created that unless you've like done it with a sieve like naturally that's the process and then you get other microbes protozoa nematodes who basically start eating the bacteria and fungi 
and then you get what I fondly call the poop loop. So it's like mm. micro poops that are essentially nutrients that were in the sand silk and clay have come through the body of a bacteria and fungi, been eaten by a protozoa or a nematode, and every time, essentially like, I mean, a, a teaspoon of healthy soil has more microbes in it than there are humans on the planet, um, and the same with like a healthy compost. So there's this unbelievable, I mean, it's hard to contextualize that in a teaspoon. Um, yeah, there's a lot of people. Um, so you can kind of, you basically want to, for me, the, the shift was seeing any landscape that I was responsible for and seeing that my role rather than, I think I used to see myself as like a dominator of it. And now any space that I'm sort of in charge of, I guess, I'm just a steward of it. And I'm trying to nurture that and develop that and build that soil. Um, if you, how, how do you do how do Yeah, you do so, that? so if you dig it, um, to any extent you disrupt that and so when you dig soil the more you disrupt it you kind of like fungi is delicate and it chops it up so you end up with lots of bacteria because they're small enough to survive that but you lose the fungi um and in terms of like natural plant succession um there's like this the the fungi to bacteria ratio i kind of i'm always arguing that that should be on any bag of compost what is the fungal to bacterial ratio of this thing i know what it is because i got a microscope and I checked pretty much every commercial compost is basically a bacteria um, almost never find any fungi um, if you've got like like weeds basically like soil will select for or against weeds that was a really cool thing that I learned I was like oh interesting like as a grower I was like ah oh, that's good that's a good thing to know um, so if you've got lots of bacteria and no fungi a weed seed will land or will already be in that sort of dormant seed bed a bit of rain will come and it will go yes it's my time and it will germinate and it will grow if you've got lots of fungi in there, if you think like um, like an old growth forest that's massively fungal dominant, there's not that many weeds around because the conditions aren't right. So that weed seed's just, it might be there, but it's just dormant, it's just waiting. And so the natural succession is like, say you had like a volcanic eruption and there's just rock, and then you get like lichen forming uh, moss, then you get weeds, then you'll get like early successional grasses, then you get like Basically, when you get to like one to one fungi to bacteria, you get like traditional row crops, vegetables, um, and then it starts to get to like shrubs, little trees, and then old growth forest. And then the natural progression would be the natural cycle would be it erupts again and it all just starts again. Um, that's what like nature's trying to do. And so for me, like in terms of stewarding, you're basically trying to, if you're trying to grow veg, you want to kind of maintain that balance yeah. of that one to one, um, which is what I try and achieve in the, in the compost. Um, so it's it's about minimal disruption to the soil. Um, things like like um, living roots in the soil. Roots release like plants release up to forty percent of their energy that they gain from the sun and bringing in carbon. They're releasing that into the soil as these exudates, which are like essentially like carbs. So it's carbon and sugars, and that's to attract the microbes um, and that the, the, they kind of partner with. So you, that's why you'll get more nutrient dense food if the microbes are there. And then they're just naturally pest and disease resistant because they create this little rhizosphere, which is like a little force field of beneficials around the roots. So like any little soil borne pathogens will just get out competed or most times eaten and just feed, like feed your plant rather than killing it. Um, Sorry, I've gone off on a tangent. No, no, so I the best thing that. basically is to leave it alone and the worst thing is to disturb it. Well, not leave it alone, but okay. just, I mean, just curate just it and steward, and steward it. it. Yeah. yeah, look after, like value your soil. Like, I mean, you never want bare soil. Uh, rain will compact it and it will wash it away, wash um, things away. And uh, like the sun, it'll just kind of like kill the microbes. Um, so mulch or and the ideal thing is living roots because then you've got this constant cycling going on. So it's almost better to not weed in a way. If all you've got is weeds, um, I mean, it depends what you want to do. Yeah. <laughs> it depends what you want to do. It's difficult to say, wait 20 years and then and then start your garden. Yeah. Um, but there are ways of kind of dealing with the weeds uh, in a way that's not kind of like not rotivating. Mm. You can sort of just hack them back, pull up the worst of them, cover it, suffocate them. Um, that could be with a you know, with some sort of membrane that could be like the whole Charles Dowding no dig thing is like cardboard, decent layer of compost. Um, and then once you've sort of established that in terms of ongoing, like if you're applying compost, if you're applying good compost, you only need a bit. I mean, um, that little bag that's been floating around, I normally fill it with like five litres, that treats 10 square metres. Wow. So you only need like a tonne per acre to apply the biology. Um, as long as there's, there's cover there or there's other organic matter there, 
they'll they'll start to do their thing and they basically multiply it's why compost gets hot if you're not artificially heating it like my composting gets up to like 60 plus degrees um but i don't heat it it's just the microbes like having this absolute party because you just create the conditions for them mm. and that heat kills weed seeds pathogens as well um so it sort of serves a purpose it's like nature's got it figured out if we mm. just again like tune into it um it it does it for us fascinating <laughs> it's mind-blowing world of soil. Has anyone got any questions for Michael? I was just interested when you were talking about the fungi and then as a garden designer, often we put mycorrhizal fungi in when we're planting shrubs and trees. Do you, is that a really good thing to do? Or, I mean, if you're starting them off from scratch, yeah. it's, it's a good idea. I mean, there's, there's different um, feelings about it in terms mm. of the stuff that you generally buy is like come from wherever. Um, whereas if you can, if you can, um, you know, create like your your own really good like living compost or find someone that's making that, there'll be. I mean, you only get mycorrhizal fungi with living roots, so you can't make it without it. So there's there's this sort of interaction that that, that they kind of need each other. Um, but you could, um, I mean, depending where you've taken it from, it hopefully will already have that going on anyway. Um, yeah. Yes, yeah, there's, there's a bit of nuance to it, really, right, um, in okay. terms of, I mean, I guess putting it down is better than nothing, okay. but ideally you would like to find it kind of indigenously, mm. um, if possible. So I need to get some from you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not good at marketing, but yeah, you can, I wait till someone suggests it. Yeah. Sorry. How's it going? Um, so basically the question was, uh, how long does it take for your compost to become, you know, from, from, the, from their door? I assume you have it in bays, do you? Have it piled in different bays? There's, there's sizes different or? processes, yeah. So I do, it's like in the containers with Bakashi, that's anaerobic, that yeah. process. Then it goes through these like in vessel hot compost units, essentially. Uh, they have this big, they're really fun, like this big crank that I just turn and it kind of churns it all up and moves it along the vessel so I can add to it every day. Okay. Um, so it's in there for like, two to three weeks at these like high temperatures. I use these things called a, it's called a Johnson Sioux bioreactor, which is a really fancy term for a very cleverly designed tall compost bay. Yeah. It's like a um, cylinder on top of a pallet. Um, you structure it around, I use soil pipes, six of those, one in the middle, five evenly spaced between that and the external. And there's like a breathable membrane. Um, and then, so I fill that around those pipes and when it's full, remove that. Um, that's kind of the process and then I add composting worms to it for once it's cooled off as well so then they go through it so I kind of I kind of don't do one specific composting method I sort of use all of them one after the other yeah, again okay. it's like diversity is key um so I go from like collecting food waste to to like what's in that bag at the moment because it depends on ambient temperatures at the moment it's about 22 24 weeks okay so it's yeah. reasonably quick hmm. um considering I'm not using any I don't even use mains water I just have rainwater it's like as kind of why, environment why connected as i can possibly be yeah, why not though eh? exactly I mean, yeah. yeah absolutely and i agree totally i guess it's um it's interesting so you don't have them on the ground so they're not so the bays aren't on the soil themselves no okay i mean so. i have a windrow so sometimes uh, i've sort of got different other methods as well that i use for demonstration um so that's just like a sort of if you were looking at down the down the down the profile of it it's like a triangle um and it's just like a, it goes all the way along um, and essentially the way that works is you you harvest from one end and then you you turn it all along yeah and then you totally. add the fresher stuff to that's the other it. end yeah. okay. um, so that's another way that i do it as well i mean it depends let's say it slows down when it's colder yeah. so um because i'm not shifting as much through the system i'll start to use that process to kind of essentially somewhere for it to be um to sort of finish off but i try and keep all the turning to a minimum the, the reason for that bay with those pipes that you you remove those so you've just got like these hollows uh, from yeah, top to the it. bottom yeah, yeah. so it's just passively aerated yeah, okay. um so then if you haven't got to turn it as i said earlier you're not chopping up the fungi it's how you're able i mean the last the last i had a guy do like a microscope check i, I mean i do it but i thought i'd get an independent one i don't ever share the ones that i do i don't want to it's like bias right um and, and the guy called me and he was like he came and took the sample himself and he, he, well, he texted me that evening it was like quarter to 10 or something at night i was just about to go to bed and he was like um sorry i'm just messaging you i haven't done the the full count of your microbes yet but i've never seen this much life under nice. my microscope Very and i was nice. like buzzing I, was, nice. I messaged him back I, and i was like i'm supposed to be going to sleep in like 10 minutes <laughs> can't sleep now. i'm not gonna sleep yeah i turned <laughs> to my wife and she was like like 
what's happened? You look like you've just, it's Christmas. Yeah, yeah, and I was just like, I've got more microbes yeah. than this guy's ever seen. And uh, so as I say, I aim for like one to one. Yeah. And that batch was almost, it was 1.38 fungi to one bacteria. So there was more fungi than bacteria, um, which is really cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's, uh, it's nice to sort of, I don't feel like I do anything particularly special. Mm. No, um, well, it does it itself. They do it themselves. You just like you said. I mean, what I used to do um, with horse manure, I used to with the horses. I used to bed everything up on straw, mm -hmm. all the horses on straw, and then use that. A lot of people use shavings. Mm -hmm. And when you spoke about shavings there earlier, I, I guess the the small little bit of research I've done is that the microbes going through the um, the chip. Mm -hmm. They they take take a lot more energy to eat, go through the chip. So using the straw as as that product yeah it, it's a lot well i find it's a lot better now you're the male, it's, you know. it's sort of quicker because it's like smaller and yeah. it's not as dense in terms of a carbon structure so mm. they'll break it down kind of quicker mm. but for me like i've done various experiments mm. I, mean, I do use like wood shavings like oak shavings from some local carpenters and stuff it's nice to have like a mixture of of sizes okay so yeah. in a in a bay particularly in a passive one like a like the uh, the bays that i use you kind of want some gaps for oxygen to kind of be in and the mm. wood chips do that really well okay. and because you're introducing microbes that are on them from like you know wherever they've come from um it, it speeds it up a bit as well so it kind of balances out okay yeah. um if you were to buy like you know a bag from somewhere it wouldn't be the same but if it's just come from you know if they've been cutting trees down yeah it's very, yeah, yeah there's two it, different it, types it's, of wood it's bringing in microbes to the site i mean i had i'm on like an old industrial estate like a derelict industrial estate. i've got two derelict buildings either side of me i'm in this space next to a river in lewis and um i've i have morels growing up popping up like i'm just not on a concrete hard stand but i've got wood chips like all over the place so it's kind of nicer to be there yeah um and i've got like a little demo garden now that i've built just out of like stuff i've sort of found um but yeah, morale's popping up and I've got a mate who's like really into fungi and he was searching for them for, for two years. And uh, I just sent him a picture and I was like, mate, you're not going to believe I just stepped on one and there's like another eight. And he was like, I've finished working an I'm hour. I'll be I'm there. On the way, I'm yeah. on my way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so he came and took some pictures and then we harvested them and ate them. Fantastic. Um, and that's just come from, that's just come to this weird industrial estate yeah. in the middle of this little town just from all the inputs that I'm bringing in, um, which kind of just demonstrates that kind of life yeah biodiversity i mean often we think about biodiversity as like bees butterflies and and birds but as i say like over 50 percent of the species on the planet live in the soil yeah, and i think we just don't think about it um because we can't see them and it maybe there's something to do with like it's literally beneath us you know they say that we it's still like really under researched yeah, even like, yeah. though we're sort of learning loads mm -hmm. all the time now um we probably know more about space because we're always looking up and we need to, we need to it, look where down. Standing, where we're standing, yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, yeah. I, I, no, I agree. I agree with that. Awesome. Cheers. Nice one. Thank Brilliant. you. Cheers. Um, you want that? Thank you. Thanks. That's so interesting.